Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for July the 31st, 2020. This is episode number 17. Today, we'll be talking about General Motors teaming up with EVgo to add over 2,700 new stations. The first Polestar 2 gets delivered in Sweden, and the Hummer EV will be revealed this fall. It's still on schedule, and we'll have crab mode. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. And he also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. So we've got some really big news this week, GM is teaming up with EVgo to vastly expand their fast charge network. Uh, uh, GM has just announced it will add over 2,700 new charging points to the EVgo network over the next five years. So that's uh, it's going to be like at least four stations per location, and that pencils out to about maybe 675 locations more or less. Uh, the chargers will be put up between well, the chargers they'll put out between uh, 100 and 350 kilowatts. So that should really help the role of uh, GM's portfolio of, of 10 or so mo electric models over uh, by 2025. So pretty exciting news, right, Tom? Yeah, this is it, it's great to hear. You know, there's three real big takeaways from this that 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 I get. Number one, for the last five or six years, GM has consistently been saying, we do not invest in infrastructure. You know, we don't invest in gas stations for gas cars. So we are not investing in infrastructure for electric vehicles. That's not our job. That, that That's, you know, somebody else's job. We make the cars, you fuel the cars. And they have been consistent. While other brands maybe haven't invested in infrastructure, they haven't taken such a stance where they're like, we're not doing it now and we will never do it. But GM was has taken that stance and they've been criticized in the past. So, you know, th that's number one, the big takeaway. Okay, they've 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 made an about face with EV infrastructure. Um and, and number two, uh for me, the good thing about this relationship with EV, EV Go is finally starting now to do multiple station sites. Um, you know, EVgo for the longest time now has has declared that they're the largest um, DC fast charge infrastructure company in America um, right. because they have the most locations, and that's correct. But nearly all of the of their locations have one charging station, and if you pull up and that's not working, or somebody else is using it, which has happened to me on a couple of occasions when I had my i3 a few years ago, you know, that's it. You're sitting there waiting for. And, and you're waiting a while because they're all 50 kilowatt stations. So right. th that brings me to my third point. Now, all these new stations are going to have multiple, lo uh, these new locations are going to have multiple stations on the average of four, they said in the press release, per location. And they're all going to be the newer 100 to 350 kilowatt uh, stations. So, you know, this is a huge improvement. Um, in the fact that we're going to have multiple uh, stations at the EVgo locations, which hasn't been the case in the past, and they're all going to be this next generation higher powered stations. So that's you know th that th this is great news for the industry. Um, you know, EVgo is still saying they're the largest network, and if you want to compare it to um, Electrify America, for instance, Electrify America has a lot less sites. They only have about 450, 460 sites. But they already have about 2,000 DC fast chargers out there. Now, how many of them work? I can't tell you, but they have about 2,000 DC fast chargers, whereas EVgo might have about 1,300 stations in the wild right now, right. and they have like 1,100 locations. <laughs> so, you know, e EVgo has been they around. Have the most, what's that? EVgo has been around a little bit longer though, right? EVgo has been around a lot longer. Electrify America has been installing stations at a rate of about 100 stations per month, wow. which is an incredible rate. Um, and this new announcement, EVgo and GM are going to install uh, 2,700 stations in the next five years. So that's not even at the pace of 
100 per month that Electrify America is at now. So, you know, while it's an amazing announcement and it's going to really mean a lot to DC Fast Charge in, in, in the country, it still isn't going to have the impact that Electrify America is having and will have. Right. Well, it might also influence uh, Electrify America to get their uh, reliability act together a little bit too. Uh, uh, we went to, or I went to uh, the local Electrify America station a, a couple of weeks ago, and you know tried to sp charge fast charge my Spark EV. Like I didn't expect it to work, but and, and it didn't. But that's fine because it is a 2015, and I know there's some communication protocol different differences. Actually, maybe the EVgo network will be able to charge it. That would be kind of nice. But anyway, so the station has like uh, what three or four pedestals, you know, with 350, uh, 250 kilowatt chargers and, and a Chatamo. Of all the pedestals, there was only one plug that worked. That was like online that you could use. And maybe the Chatamo, I don't know. I couldn't use that anyway. But yeah, so that was disappointing. So yeah, I'm hoping hoping this will light a fire underneath Electrify America and you know, because they need to get their act together. It's good to have stations, but if they don't work, that's, that doesn't really help much. It's clearly a problem right now, Dom, the Electrify America reliability. It's it's you know, we, I had I had hoped that at this point they would be improving. And it seemed for a while like they were. Um, when I did my uh, trip down to meet Kyle down in, in North Carolina, uh, Kyle and I drove, you know, two different EVs, basically from New Jersey to North Carolina. And then I drove back. We didn't have one glitch the whole way. We used Electrify America the whole way. I drove the Mini Cooper. I had to stop like every 90 miles. So, uh, you know, I charged a lot. Didn't have one glitch. So I, I after that road trip, I kind of said, wow, I think I think they've done it. I think they, they're getting there. But to be honest, since then, I've been doing these range tests and I'm having problems nearly every time that I'm using the stations. And uh, I'm in communication with Electrify America about this. They promise they have software update coming at the end of the month. They have this. They have that. That's great. Do it. Get these stations working because it's a problem. The one last thing I want to add about the EVgo announcement is I'm curious to see what connectors are on these stations. You know, EVgo signed a deal with Tesla. They're the only infrastructure network now that is allowed to use Tesla connectors. So, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if these new stations pop up with CCS on one side and Tesla on the other and no Chatamo? You know, these are going to start to be installed in 2021. By the end of 2021, there will probably not be any Chatamo cars being sold in America anymore. So, right. you know, yes, there'll be legacy cars, but do you now, if you're EV Go, do you go out there and 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 put these connectors on all the on, on 3,000 charging stations for a standard that's no longer being sold? You know, right. I it, it, it you you might you might see you know Tesla and and CCS connectors. Um, that's a question we've got to ask EVgo when we have the opportunity. Hey, so Kyle, would would having uh, some more Tesla chargers help you help you at all? You're like crisscrossing the country right now. Yeah, well, I think uh, sorry for the noise here. There's a garbage truck driving past. <laughs> well, I think uh, having more options would be better. I've used my Chatamo adapter probably seven times on this trip, eight uh -huh. times, uh, and about three of those, I've really needed that Chatamo charge. And so I would say the supercharger network, no question, is by far the best network currently to drive across the U.S. in terms of getting places. I think if we can have a reliable 250, 350 kilowatt type station uh, with Tesla connectors, I would say ditch the Chatamo side. Um, it would certainly make things better. And I think we need more of a focus on on national parks as such a huge uh, gray spot that I've noticed that I see a ton of EVs at and then I see a ton of EVs plugged into wall outlets and people camping there for four days to charge up their car. I just uh, don't understand why uh, the U.S. government wouldn't want to put uh, fast chargers at their most popular tourist destinations. Right. It doesn't make sense. Well, yeah, there's, there's, a lot there's, the, there's a lot about the U.S. That government that doesn't make sense right now. But anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, this, uh, so the the other one interesting thing about this is that they do ha they will have 350 kilowatt hour charging stations. So that kind of bodes well for um, the coming GM vehicles. We can assume that the Hummer EV 
and the other large, like the GM, uh, the Chevy pickup truck, those are all 800 volt systems, and they're most likely going to use that 350 kilowatt charging. I'm not sure if they'll be like the Taycan and only charge at 275 for now, but you know, that's a, that's a pretty good speed anyway, and it'll, it'll make a big difference, especially if you have a big trucks and you're hauling stuff and use a lot of energy. You know, it'll get you down the road. So, but moving on, uh, other great news this week: the first uh, European Polestar 2 customer car has been delivered in Sweden. So congratulations are in order for the Polestar brand. That's the offshoot of Volvo, of course, uh, which except for its uh, Polestar 1, that was a, a high performance plug-in hybrid coupe. Uh, they will, this, this brand will build and sell all electric vehicles. So the first customer has received their Polestar 2. Uh, Stur Stenson, I think that's his name, uh, ordered on launch day. And that was the end of February last year, 2019. And it's his first EV. And he says he has uh, solar panels on his roof ready to help charge it. Uh, Stenson says that he's had many new cars over the year, but this uh, quote was the greatest moment so far. So deliveries will now happen in, in Norway, then Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and the UK, and finally Switzerland and North America. And I believe deliveries are also underway in uh, China, and it's built in China. So we've seen it, also seen a number of reviews of, of this car recently. Uh, it's really the only Tesla Model 3 competitor out there at the moment, and reviewers have been pretty kind to it so far. Uh, as a reminder, this has a U.S. MSRP of about, uh, was it $59,900 before the tax credit. So, Kyle, uh, I believe you're a big fan of Volvos. What do you think of this car? Yeah, well, I like Volvo and all of Geely Group in general. I think they're doing a really good job uh, as their parent company. I mean, anything from the London taxi that's now a range extended plug-in hybrid to the Lotus Savaya to now the, the Polestar 2 launching, this company's really doing a lot for electrification and coming out with some really enticing and really cool products. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's a fantastic story for Polestar 2 to deliver this car because, you know, obviously we, we always talk about cars that are promised to come into the future and that are close, but now finally there is a customer delivered vehicle on the road. So big check mark there. That shows a good future for Polestar. Um, you know, I, I'm going to drive this car in just a few days. I'm flying over to New York to um, drive the Polestar 2 with the performance package um, and it's out of Manhattan, so I'm not quite sure how much driving I'll really get, but I'm going into it with relatively high expectations. You have a company that's built uh, amazingly stylish, premium, great driving vehicles from Volvo, and now you're going to put a, a new 74 kilowatt hour battery pack in there, um, old end suspensions, big brakes. So it's kind of this luxury, sporty mix of, of SUV hatchback. It's kind of the perfect blend. And uh, I'm excited to see if it can hold up while driving. I've sat in the car uh, in Europe and materials were really nice. Cabin was designed perfectly, I think. Their Android system was really cool that was built into the UI. And uh, now all left to do to uh, basically reserve final judgment is the driving impressions. And let's hope it drives as good as it looks. It's hard to say how much uh, how much of the dynamics you can really get a good feel of on, on the streets of Manhattan. So hopefully that you have some some room to groove there a little bit. Um, I believe it's a little heavier than the Model 3, if that's right. And I'll be, I'll be really curious how what you think about the ride is compared to the, compared to the Tesla. Right. Well, I wish I was driving the non-performance package for, I would say, 90% of the consumers because I don't think many people are going to get that option. Uh, I definitely would on my car. So, you know, if, if I were purchasing one, this is great. Um, but, but I would say it's probably not necessary for most people buying an EV commuting. It's a $5,000 option, and really it just gives you uh, gold seat belts, which is worth it all together for me, but also uh, big brakes and, and Olin's adjustable suspension. I believe it's manually adjustable suspension as well, which who's going to want to get up underneath their Polestar 2 and twist knobs other than this guy right here? That's why I'm so excited about it. Um, but I am going to take it up the Hudson River. We're going to go find some good roads. Um, Polestar has sort of this route. I grew up there, so I know some really great roads, and we're going to rip on it. Dynamically, we'll test the driver assist, and then, of course, we'll test the road comfort on the awful New York City roads. Right on. So um, so if you have any questions about the, the Polestar 2, 
as Kyle said, he's going to drive it in a couple of days. So leave us a comment down in the comments here on YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube or on the uh, Inside EVs podcast post, or I guess while we're talking about it, the Inside EVs forum has a special thread in the general section uh, with all the podcasts, you know, uh, sitting there and you can, you can, you know, discuss all the things and ask us these questions. What you, what do you want to know about the Polestar 2? So Tom, do you like gold, uh, gold seat belts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not really high on my list. Um, I like the Polestar too. Um, I just, I'm, I'm still, I still wish they just named it Volvo, and I just think <laughs> it would have a better acceptance in the U.S. Um, I, you know, I think the EVs are new, and the, the enthusiasts like Kyle and and the four of us, and probably many of our viewers here, you know, it probably isn't a problem with them because they've heard Polestar, they've They've, you know, that they've seen this is coming, but the average consumer, like my sister, for instance, love, loves Volvo. She's had like five of them and she's been warming up to EVs now. She's asked me about, you know, electric vehicles. She's not buying a Polestar, you know, but if it was, if it was the same car and it was a Volvo, you know, S 40 E or whatever, she might buy it. So, you know, I, I just, that bothers me a little bit, probably more than anybody else here, uh, uh, because I know, you know, we've talked about this in the past, and I don't think that seems to be a problem with anyone else. But it, it, I, I just, I don't get it. Um, I like the car. I think it's a great car. I've sat in it. Um, I'm, I'm a little jealous of Kyle. He's getting to drive it next week. I'm, I'm only like 30 miles away. I might sneak over and like watch him and take pictures of him doing it. But um, I'll come uh, pick you up. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, may, may, maybe something like that. We can be arranged. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I do wish it was just under the Volvo brand name at a Volvo dealership with the Volvo badge sitting on it in a showroom. I think it would sell better, in the, at least in the U.S. Right. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Polestar has like 14 stores, like the whole across the whole world, they call, call them spaces. So, yeah, they're, and they're in like China, Europe, and we have like two or three in North America, which is like, you know, nothing really. So, yeah. So you make a good point. And underneath it all, it's really a Volvo. And it, it still has like a really strong Volvo styling. So, right. Well, yeah. it's part of the Geely group, but what they're able to do with this brand that Volvo is not able to do is uh, direct manufacturer to consumer sales. You're not going to uh, have dealerships in the way. Um, you know, Volvo is getting this exact car in the XC40 recharge underneath. It's the same thing. Uh, right. So it's built on the Volvo uh, CMA platform. It's, it, I agree with Tom saying that to the average consumer, they're unaware of the name Polestar, and then you hear it's going to be built in China, but it's designed in Sweden. I guess it, it sounds a little bit Ikea-ish, um, but I think really the car is going to speak for itself. I think the styling will tell people that it's Volvo, and for all the car enthusiasts uh, that will likely be early adopters of this product, we're familiar with Polestar because they've been tuning Volvos. Polestar was like AMG to Mercedes. It was an independent tuning agency. Volvo bought the name, bought the company. It then became all the fast Volvos. Recently, I reviewed the V60T8 Polestar, which was the plug-in hybrid performance Volvo. And then now it's spun off as its own company. And so, um, yeah, I, I do agree with brand recognition, but I, I think that'll be a one or two year problem. And in Europe, they're probably much more open to this type of thing. And in the U.S., it'll give it give it some time. But uh, I, I think it's the right move, actually, just because of the sales model that they're able to have. Mm -hmm. So real, real, real quickly, Martin, what do you think about this name Polestar? Do you think that do you think uh, customers will or consumers will, you know, uh, will accept that pretty quickly over there? Yeah, and I don't think there's a problem with being a new brand. It is interesting. I don't know what the history is in the US. Volvo here definitely has evolved its reputation. So Volvo over here was all about boxy estate cars that would save your life in an accident, right? right. Ridic ridiculously strong, the first ones to have airbags. And but that was that was Volvo brand now around uh, 94 96 volvo went racing in the british touring car championship uh, that was when touring cars over here was really uh, you know on a uh, on a high and that was when you had formula 1 drivers and nigel mansell and driving in 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 touring cars and so you had alfa romeo involved and and all the big manufacturers and it was a uh, a time when volvo entered racing uh, with the estate cars the 850 are and uh and it changed their perception over here so much and then they started going with performance cars and now the volvo brand 
is thought of really, really well in terms of both. They've kept the safety thing. They've kept the, the quirky Swedish styling thing. And they've also now got this reputation of being able to make some properly rapid cars when they want to. So I'm kind of with Tom. I think if you call this the Volvo Polestar 1, the Volvo Polestar 2, the mm -hmm. Volvo Polestar 3, you know, they can, you know, you, you could call it or the P1 or the P2, whatever, but put Volvo in front of it. You've got a dealer network. You've got um, some pretty good brand recognition and actually some good brand values as well. Now, 20 years ago, you couldn't have done that because it was still seen as staid and slow, safe, but, mm -hmm. you know, a bit of a boring family car if you had, you know, no ambitions. But now you genuinely choose that as a, as a, 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 a performance car. So what about in the US? What's the brand like there? You know, that's why, that's why I was like, you guys go that's why I brought it up. It has such a good brand recognition here. It's thought of as safe, powerful, um, uh, elegant, you know, um, it's premium. Uh, and, and it's, you know, it's like, um, you know, the, 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 the BMWs and the Mercedes and the Audis, that's like, you know, everybody has one of those. But like the Volvo almost is like a little bit of a niche. It's almost like Jaguar, like it's premium uh, but you're not driving the car that everyone else is driving. Um, and it, it's thought of so well that that's why to me, like, and I, and I use my sister as the example and, you know, she's a, she's a Volvo, a loyal Volvo customer. She's thinking about electric cars now. No way she's buying anything from Polestar. Even if I tell her, well, it's made by Volvo and uh, well, it's made in China, but you know, like it just isn't going to compute. And to, Maybe Kyle's right. Maybe this is only a two or three year transition and people will learn. Uh, and maybe I'm not looking long term. And the, the, the advantages of being able to sell direct to customer will really start to flourish a few years down the road. Maybe I'm just looking at it through a fishbowl of today. But right mm. now, you know, with this thing launching, um, the, only the early adopters and enthusiasts are going to be interested in it. You know, that typical Volvo buyer you know, is, is not going to be interested in this, in Polestar. And then, like I said, you combine that with that, it's coming from China. There's kind of a, a growing anti-Chinese sentiment here in the U S I mean, the coronavirus didn't help. And, mm. uh, you know, so, you know, this new brand from China, uh, electric, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned about, I, I don't think it's going to sell well here at all. I, I, I really don't think we're going to sell many copies in the U S and I think it's a shame because it's a really nice vehicle. What about servicing? That really concerns me as well. It's one of the, you know, I know that Tesla Rangers are a, a more recent phenomenon around the world. And I don't even know if they're in the UK as, as, as prolific as they are in, in the US. So of course, Tesla will come to you now. But what about servicing? Like things go wrong, you know, with the best will in the world. It's a machine and, and there's going to be through no fault of their own times when it needs to go back to a a service center. So is that a pole star space that it has to go back to? And in which case, how many miles away are they going to send a, a recovery truck? Mm -hmm. Can my local Volvo, are they going to be pole star, like a, a pole star tech trained in a Volvo dealership or not? I don't think so. And so that's a big concern. The car, you know, your car is the second biggest purchase you'll probably make behind your house. Mm -hmm. And it is a genuine, it's a, it, it's a, it's a concern for Tesla clearly because they're, they're pushing uh, their mobile service pretty hard. What do you know about the uh, service situation there, Kyle? Yeah, I don't have answers, but um, on, I think, Tuesday? Anyway, sometime early next week, I'm going to have a meeting with the uh, project director for Polestar 2, uh, who's based in Sweden, and she and I will uh, certainly talk about a lot of these questions that we bring up here, as well as our viewer ask questions down below. And then, of course, I'll even have more opportunity when I go to drive the car. But these are all valid points. Uh, right. Cars need service networks. Things break. Uh, I, you know, even on my Tesla here that, you know, is supposedly, you know, will last forever. Uh, you know, I, I have to make service appointments quite regularly for this car. Uh, right. And for every Tesla I've owned, it's just EVs still have problems with trim pieces and little things like this that need to go back to places like a service well, 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 I've got while I've got you there, by the way, there's the big thing for me, just like <laughs> a viewer question from me. Uh, but uh, it would be the software. I'm, I'm increasingly seeing the software as a differentiator in, e, in EVs because the hardware, whilst it's not being commoditized, don't get me wrong, Tesla and, and, and you know the individual companies are still designing their own things. But largely, I'm, I'm beginning to think that software is going to be the the key thing that lots of people look for. Look, it, it's 
it's fair to say that software in most cars until recently has been either functional or just downright sucky. It's just, it turns the heating on and off, you know, and if you're lucky, the touchscreen is moderately responsive in changing radio station or listening to a podcast. And, you know, that's all changing now, but it's not, this isn't Android Auto that it sits on. Actually, the software physically sits on the Android operating platform. So, you know, personally, my question to you would be, please give that a real hard uh, kind of go, going over and, and, and not just responsiveness times, but also can you get stuff done quickly? Is it intuitive? Because if so, maybe more car makers are going to be looking at these kind of solutions rather than going to those those typical routes they've done obviously vw and uh, have gone gone big on on software recently and trying to sort out their things but i'm increasingly seeing that as a as a big difference that's going to be a uh, you know a point of value in buying an ev yeah well i'm right. looking forward to spending more time with the ui i've i got to experience it at ces last year i sat in a volvo xc40 recharge with the same android system and uh, it, I mean, it was instant, super snappy. It was at the Google booth, so you'd expect it to be really quite good. Um, but you know, it, they are in full partnership with Google for their UI. Obviously, just seeing the the XC40 recharge at the official Google booth at CES was a huge deal. And so, look, I mean, I, I'm going to try a few different tasks in the system. For example, uh, I think the the easiest thing that you need your car to do that is so difficult for manufacturers to get into their system is navigation. When you get into a Tesla, this is the best part about a Tesla UI. You have a big navigate button. You touch it. You say you want to go to Panda Express, which is a place I regularly go to. It finds me the closest <laughs> one. And if it's too far away, it'll tell me how far I need to drive with superchargers, how long I wait there. And it's a less than 10 second operation. This is key right. for every EV to have. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, I think we'll see a lot. Uh, us, we'll see some more like and with Android Auto uh, moving into like a car, like like the Polestar. Maybe we'll see some more, uh, some more of that integration across across different brands. So like, for, OK, for instance, our next story is Tesla is open to licensing software, supplying powertrains and batteries. So maybe we could see uh, another car license Tesla software. So you have that operating system in, in you know, in another non-Tesla brand. And maybe we'll see Android show up in, in other, I don't want to mention any names, but in other brands. So just to uh, to get on that, this Tesla story. So Elon Musk tweeted that Tesla is open to licensing software and supplying powertrains and batteries. We're just trying to accelerate sustainable energy, not crush competitors, he says in quotes there. Uh, now, this sounds great, of course, but, but what effect might it actually have? What automaker might be interested in these in these things at this point? Um, most of the majors already have their electric ducts lined up at, for the most part. Uh, VW has its MEB platform and supplying Ford with that as well. And of course, uh, uh, one could argue, considering the much discussed difficulties that VW is having with its software, that they could benefit here. But that would mean scrapping what they have now, which was you know developed specifically for their hardware and their battery systems, in which they probably have you know hundreds of millions of dollars already invested in. Uh, anyway, meanwhile, GM has developed its own flexible EV platform and an Alt Altium batteries, uh, which it will supply to Honda, uh, and I, I I don't think Mercedes, BMW, or Volvo would buy. Chrysler has some electric tech it could borrow from Fiat. That's a scary thought. Um, it's just given Fiat's history. But um, uh, but when the uh, Peugeot Citroen merger happens, uh, they'll have some more as well they could possibly lean on. So I don't know if they have anything well suited for the larger American vehicles. So like who's who's left? Uh, to my mind, the the best case scenario would be a deal with Toyota. Um, they did supply some of the powertrain for the second generation RAV4 EV. Uh, that didn't that marriage didn't work out particularly well. Tesla was still pretty immature at the time, and Toyota put that in a, into a platform just before it changed generations. So it was selling like the RAV4 EV one generation, and then it was selling the next generation RAV4 at the same time. And, you know, you're gonna buy the new, brand new, sparkly RAV4, or you're gonna buy this older RAV4 that you know has this third-party electric powertrain, you know, it didn't really work out so well. So for whatever reasons, uh, yeah, they couldn't, and they, they couldn't take advantage of the supercharger network. So that further limited the appeal. So, so what do you think about this, Tom? Do you so, so talking about, you know, intro Toyota introducing the RAV4 electric, 
at the same time that they're introducing the next generation. So you can get either a new one, uh, a new a new gas one, or the last generation's electric. They did that also with the first generation RAV4 EV, if you remember. When that came out, they also had a new generation RAV4. So you can get the nice, new, shiny one, but you've got to power it with gas. Or you can get last generation one that we've been selling the last five years, and that one can plug in. So they did it twice. Uh, you know, once could be a coincidence, timing issue with when the car was going to be available. But, you know, you do it two times in a row and it's like, OK, you know, all right, you really are trying to push people away from from, from, from the plug in version. Um, wow. You know, and I, personally, this is like the biggest non story of the week for us. This is just Elon bored and, and wanting to tweet something. Because th this has been the case, all Tesla's been saying this all over, all, you know, from the beginning that they're always open to working with partners and lic licensing their battery tech and, and 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 everything, you know, that they're 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 all about just um, helping the whole industry turn, you know, convert and and let electric vehicles proliferate. So th this isn't th this is nothing new. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't see anybody taking them up on it. Like nobody really has ever taken them up on it. Other than, like we said, these two cases where we had the Mercedes with the B-Class right. EV and Toyota with the RAV4. And in those cases, these two manufacturers just needed to get some plug-in cars out there to comply, to satisfy you know, the, the, the zero emission vehicle um, regulations. And they didn't want to put any money, much money into, you know, in-house engineering. So like, okay, we'll just buy that. And hey, Tesla make this fit in our existing platform and make 2000 or 3000 of them. Or her. They, they were both very small, limited runs just to meet compliance. Right. Uh, but I don't see any major auto manufacturer um, at this point, partnering with Tesla for like a new car that they're trying to make and sell in volume. All these companies believe that they have the best engineers in the world in their own company. They don't need to go outside and get, um, you know, engineers from other companies making products for them. I mean, that's at least how they believe what they believe. So, you know, I, you know, I don't see it happening. Um, you know, I think a lot of the companies could learn a lot from what Tesla's done. Um, it might be better to pay the $90,000 and buy the Model Y full teardown report from Sandy Monroe, um, right. a, as opposed to hiring Tesla to build your own platform. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't see anybody taking Tesla up on this. Uh, you know, uh, I think this is a non-story. Right. It, it's not, gonna, it's not going to happen because of batteries in a million years. You know, if I can power, paraphrase the last two or three earnings calls where Elon uh, does have to have at least some responsibility of, you know, of what he says, not just okay. shooting the breeze on, on Twitter, uh, the, the, the questioning roughly goes, hey, Elon, why haven't you built the semi-truck yet? His answer, we don't have enough batteries. And that's it. They are not open to giving batteries to anyone else until they don't need them. And that's... It's not going to happen for a really, really long time. Tesla does not have a single spare battery in the company to sell to another company for that company to then mark up and sell on to their customers, let alone at any kind of scale. Like every single battery that Tesla can get, they've talked about it you know, last week as well. So the LFP batteries, which are going to be used for standard range plus and increasingly less performance oriented cars, allow them to use the high performance cells for whatever they need, whether it's faster cars or whether that is going to be more density or whether it's going to be Cybertruck or semi, whatever. But the idea that Tesla has like a, a warehouse full of spare batteries that they can uh, sell to another car maker is absolutely ridiculous. And the software thing is, is ridiculous as well. If somebody spent three seconds of thought on this, it, it's absolutely not going to work. Tesla spend all of their time making their cars a little bit better and no, other, that just doesn't integrate with any other car maker. I mean, what was the most, there was an update this week, wasn't it? That, that I'm not a Tesla owner, but isn't there something that if you're not sitting in the passenger seat, the the, the heating and the aircon doesn't blow at the at the passenger? Right. Another That's way right. of saving just another few percent of energy only yeah. keeps the driver cool. How's that going to work? You, you're licensing your software to somebody else, and all of a sudden, oh, we have another update, by the way. But oh, your cars don't have the uh, the bum sensors <laughs> in in the right seat. It's ridiculous. The whole thing is just Elon looking for good PR because he's probably, as Tom says, bored on Twitter. And it, you know what? It never hurts to be the good guy 
saying, well, oh, we just, we just want to help out. We just want to, we want to help. Come on, you guys, take us up on our offer. No well, one's coming calling. And even if number someone called, they're not in a position to say yes. Well, for a second there, I was thinking, well, you know, if, if, the, if a company like just say Toyota, you know, were to say, oh, okay, we'll give, we'll put up a few billion dollars to make a new gigafactory and then you can use, we can use uh, Tesla's and Panasonic's, you know, technology in those batteries. But yeah, it, does, uh, does Tesla and Panasonic really have, you know, a uh, are their batteries really that much better than what maybe LG can get? Uh, Panasonic, uh, there's a report out on Reuters, Reuters, Reuters excuse me, this week that uh, Panasonic is planning on boosting the energy density of its batteries for Tesla by 20%, which sounds you know really good as a headline, but then you look at it, it's over five years, you know, and so. If they, I think they have maybe they're sitting on like a five percent improvement right now, and we'll we'll find out more on Battery Day. Uh, so let's see how does this go. So they reported that right, Tesla will start converting production lines at Giga Nevada in September, which will coincide roughly with uh, Battery Day on the twenty second of September. Uh, now I might be cynical, but that doesn't sound especially amazing. Uh, it's good news that it's good news about getting rid of the co- getting rid of the cobalt too, uh, but twenty percent of over five years doesn't strike me as like earth shaking. That's like, you know, just a few percent a year. And uh, I'm under the impression, you know, that's kind of what we've been doing all along anyway, you know, that's sort of like business as usual kind of thing. Uh, so that would make like a, a model three or model Y long range pack. It weighs about 480 kilograms, like a, or 1,058 pounds. So after five years, it'll be about 200 pounds lighter, maybe because that's not just a, that's just the sales part. The other part, you know. So how do, how does this improvement strike you, Kyle? Yeah, I I just think it's not a huge deal. I you know right now it's probably easier just to add more batteries to get a better performing electric car. Uh, of course, we'll see cell improvements, but 20% over five years, we're sort of expecting that anyway, if not more. So it doesn't seem like anything crazy. I will say Giga Nevada, though, um, certainly is going to be in for a challenge producing more cells. I was just out there uh, maybe three or four days ago, and just the number of people during a shift change is insane. Uh, so they are staffed, they're running flat out as much as they can, and there's a lot of activity. But you know, I think introducing these cell changes, we'll see if it makes a huge difference or not. I, I'm gonna reserve judgment for battery day and then reserve judgment again till it actually makes it into a car. Because a lot of these stories, we hear headlines and then in four or five years, they don't mean anything. You're so sensible. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of speaking of Tesla, um, so their the Giga Factory Austin site we was revealed last week, and but the work has started there already. Like just when they were making the announcement, there was already you know heavy machinery moving dirt in in the on the lot, you know, right by the uh, uh, I forget the name of the river. It, it's like a it's located within the a loop of the local river there. Um, so we have we have a, there's a few videos on the site now. So if you go to Inside EVs and search for Austin, you should be able to find the most recent post, and there you'll see some drone footage of the site. So that means like the race is on now for uh, between Tesla, Rivian, and GMC for the first electric pickup to hit c- customers' driveways. So uh, Rivian announced this week that their truck deliveries are going to start in June 20, 2021 now with the R1S that's the suv coming two months later so rivian should have been the first but it's in it's pushed its uh delivery baits back a couple times now understandably of course with the pandemic and and everything but uh you know this kind of sucks um but yeah it is what it is Uh, but they also included in this news they also included uh, you know this like picture of there's like a truck frame in a jig as as you can see on the screen if you're watching this on youtube um that's the pre-production line. They've got it completed. So at least they'll be able to, you know, get their pre-production testing fleet out, you know, a little quicker. Now they've already had some, some trucks out and at, with the same news, they also released some video that was really super. Actually, that's, that was the best part of this news because, you know, I just love seeing this thing in action. So they showed it, uh, doing awesome things on the racetrack and climbing some gnarly looking Hills. Uh, if it can keep on schedule, you know, Rivian should be the winner, but, any more setbacks, it's going to be a tighter race uh, because, like the GMC uh, Hummer electric pickup truck, uh, they actually they just released the 
some uh, a press release this this past week, uh, and the GMC Hummer EV is going to be uh, revealed this fall, and it will have crab mode. <laughs> and yeah, uh, so despite that, despite the pandemic, you know, it's still on target to hit its original date. There, you know, which fall twenty twenty one, and so like along with that news from GMC, they also. Re- uh, they included a new video with a couple of shots of the Hummer EV pickup and SUV in in profile, uh, mostly hidden in shadows. And it will have the, they said that we'll have this crab mode, uh, super fast charging, which we now know you know could be as fast as 350 kilowatts. We'll have to, we'll have to see to make sure. And something with uh, they'll, they'll have the next generation of Super Cruise and something called Ultra Vision cameras. But and, yeah, but I'm mostly mostly intrigued by this crab mode. Kyle, what does that mean to you? And, and who, yeah. do you th- who do you think is going to win this race to the, the right driveways? Well, I, I'm not so sure delivery time totally matters in the long run as to whoever's first. I sure. think uh, Rivian's really captured the audience of adventure EV seekers. Like uh, like me, I can't think of a better car that I would want to do this exact road trip that I'm on now than a Rivian R1T or R1S. Uh, would I want to do this in a Hummer EV SUV? No, it really isn't for my generation. I, I the Hummer name, it, they're cool. I love the H1. I don't know. We'll see what that ends up looking like and and news coming forwards. Um, who will win the race? I think Rivian in the long run will win this race uh, for consumer EV pickup truck. Uh, now the other side of it is work truck side. I don't think this is geared towards heavy duty throwing a ladder on the back. Um, but but that's a huge market, like Tom had mentioned last episode or two episodes ago, that Rivian is not going to capture, and that leaves space for other manufacturers to come in. But I think in this particular space, which is like the the guy who just drives a pickup truck around to drive a pickup truck around, Rivian's going to take it, in my opinion. In, in volume, you think? Because I, I was seeing somewhere this week that uh, the Cybertruck might have as many as a million pre-orders right now. Oh, yeah, I mean, Cybertruck... For sure, when we when we think about that, you're going to have the the thing with Cybertruck, and we spoke about this as well. It's going to take a lot of non SUV, non pickup truck people, and bring them into the pickup truck world. It's going to take basically every Model Three owner, and then they're going to stretch and get a Cybertruck. But are normal people off the street going to get a Cybertruck? Some, but I don't think this. Uh, you know, even with a million pre orders, I I really do believe, and, and I've been going down in my estimates every week but i i think 20 percent will convert to orders on a good case so we'll see so tom you're a normal person would you buy a cyber truck normal <laughs> i've been called a you lot of things but I rarely ever do people call me normal tom <laughs> um yeah i have a reservation for the cyber truck um i i also think that the hum the hummer is going to be more of a cyber truck competitor than the rivian uh, although they, I mean, they all compete in the same space because it's more of like a a, a, a wild, you know, rugged, you know, uh, it's thousand horsepower, eleven thousand over eleven thousand pound feet of torque, um, crab mode now, you know, it's it's uh, you know, which while we don't know for sure what it is, I'm pretty sure it means the rear wheels are going to be able to, you know, steer also. So it would allow you to make tighter turns if you put the wheels in the opposite direction. And if you put them in the same direction, you know, the car can, while it won't be able to go exactly sideways, it'll be able to go on an angle sideways. Um, I mean, that could be the only thing I can imagine because like as a, you see a crab turn its body sideways and kind of walk on an angle. Um, I mean, that, that would be what, what makes sense. We don't know for sure, but I, I mean, I, I bet that that's well, what it's going to be individual motors that can spin opposite direction to move the car like you're saying but i i think the front axle will play as well i'm pretty sure it's not rear steer i think it's just the way they're going to be spinning uh each individual wheel to make it move left or right is my guess so let's let's say yeah they 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 haven't said anything about that yet i know that there are the term crab mode has been used in in like military vehicles and uh, so, like, I, I know it's out there, and in most cases, when the, it's been referred to as crab mode and, and experimental vehicles, that's been the, with, because the rear wheels can can angle. But 
Um, you know, Kyle's guess is as good as anyone's, and Kyle knows a lot about cars. Maybe he's right. Uh, we'll, we'll, we should learn soon um, what what that is. But but you know what's great about this, guys, and I'm sure you know everybody will agree. Look at what electric vehicles are doing. They're introducing all these new cool things that we haven't seen before. Like the automobile industry was stagnant for years, and yeah, we were making cars that were faster and cars that you know, could handle better and get better gas mileage and, you know, we're quieter and, but like, we're doing crazy stuff now with, with, with electrification. And uh, I mean, look at the cyber truck, look at Rivian with the tank, you know, track mode. And uh, I mean, just so many cool things are coming out of electrification now. And that's, that's really what excites me. Like what's next? What are, what, what's going to blow us away a year from now when somebody introduces that next ridiculous, crazy thing. Um, and that's really what one of the cool things about what's happening with electrification now. Yeah. Well, I really hope it, I really hope it has rear wheel steering. I, I looked at the, uh, at the prototype, I looked at the chassis and I didn't see anything like that would indicate it could steer, but mm -hmm. I used to ride a, my, my boss back way back in the day, had a, uh, a Honda prelude with four wheel steering. And uh, man, I loved <laughs> driving that thing for parallel parking or just, you know, ripping off uh, highway exits or whatever. It was just, you know, it just felt so good. And, so if you had some rear wheel steering and some front wheel steering and just see in my mind, crab mode is like sideways maybe, and you yeah. probably couldn't do it on pavement, but I'm, I'm thinking in the dirt, you know, cause yeah, like even like the Rivian tank turn spinning in place, mm -hmm. you can't really do that on pavement. Yeah. Uh, even I, I have a, an old four wheel drive pickup truck and even in four wheel drive, that thing, it, 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 you can hardly drive it you know, on pavement in four wheel drive and, and make and turn, it'll, it'll buck and jump. And it's, you know, it's really for, you know, the dirt. So yeah, I'll be really, uh, real, be really curious to see exactly what this thing is. And there you can see on the screen now, the, the clay model of the Hunter EV, that thing, zero to 60 in like three seconds. That's crazy, man. That's, <laughs> I mean, we'll see if they make it. It's not anything until it hits the production. For sure. Line. Sure, but I mean, I've, I've seen it, and we'll we'll be seeing everyone will be seeing it this fall. And yeah, I have the same feelings about with uh, as you, Kyle, about the. I'm not really. I was never a big like, Hummer fan personally myself. I liked the, like the the military vehicle. It's kind of cool, but you know the the image of the the Hummer in in the uh, 2000s wasn't kind of really my thing. So I think they need to kind of reinvent the whole Hummer mystique, and you know, it does have a lot of features that are really cool, with, like the glass roof. And and just being you know, just being electric and th that kind of performance. I mean, the, the original the uh, the consumer Hummer, you know, wasn't like a, a super performer, but you know, zero to sixty in three seconds. That's that's kind sure. of craziness. Anyway, Martin, you have some quick thoughts on this? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I'm just not sure how what the what the market is like for that size vehicle anymore. Um, you know, th things come around, things are cyclical, right? So things, things come around and I don't live and I'm, I'm a few thousand miles away from you, but if it's going to be, and I've look, not looked at the specification if they have put that out, but that's, it's like the cyber truck. Like it's such a big vehicle. It's, it's and big. maybe, maybe you has a European head speaking now, but right. it's, it's such a bit, the cyber truck is so big and Hummer is so big. And although there's no emissions on it, I just wonder how much the world has moved on from that image of you know the Humvee and Desert Storm and I don't know how much we've moved on, but look, obviously we wish everyone all the best in making these cars because if it can be a properly impressive EV, to Tom's point, it's great. It just gives it all the uh, the, the the combustion fans envy, and we love that. Right. Hey, so speaking of uh, European kind of things, then the uh, Volkswagen ID three. Uh, First drives have kind of happened, and we have a review up on in, inside of, uh, inside EVs, and you can also find some um, some reviews from uh, other outlets like on inside EVs. We have the uh, the big one by Otto Gaffel, which is like one of my favorite uh, reviewers with, with Tomas. And uh, so yeah, they're, they're driving the ID3 now. We can kind of see it and get some uh, third party reactions to it, and uh, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know what to think. You can see here on your screen if you're watching on YouTube. It's, you know, it looks modern to me, but it's not, you know, super out there. I, I kind of like it personally. 
but wait, you know, as wait, for, wait for the ID4. Don't buy an ID3. Get an ID4. It's more yeah. practical. It's a crossover size. You'll thank yourself in the end. But I mean, the inside of the ID, the, the ID3, they're seen as like golf size on the outside, but Passat size on the inside. Because if you look at the picture again, it's got super short low overhangs on the front and the back, so that in, that uh, um, passenger compartment is like you know pretty re relatively spacious considering what you have. It, do you need an ID? Like we're not getting the ID3 here in North America, at least as far as we know yet. It could happen, but yeah. Really yeah, I mean, those, those, those short overhangs and that flat battery i mean we'll say this quietly in case bmw are listening but that's why you should build an ev yes. on a dedicated platform so you've got yeah. all the space inside and no transmission tunnel it's got nothing running down the middle of it but uh it, it, just the, the the car itself is fantastic but the id4 is coming so you know quickly uh whether that is because uh, you, you can't buy the id3 in the us so you can't buy one but uh, but either way or, or, or it's a variant of it like the skoda eniac iv or a, any of those cars that are going to be the id4 size just gonna be more practical and it's just although i don't own a crossover suv and i, I don't really want one most people do Mm -hmm. I was I was wondering about the uh, the value proposition. I don't know if you saw the videos, but the interior had some you know hard plastics and some things that just mm, for like a thirty five thousand dollar pound or euro you know price range. Yeah, how you, you kind of I I thought you'd want a little bit more and there'll be like soft touch materials here and there. Well, Tom, kind you've of, seen the inside of this car, right? And I, I know I have. I've sat in it. And I, I loved it. I just thought it was the perfect blend of everything. The, the, the plastics were done in a way where it kind of felt cool and modern and funky. It wasn't, uh, uh, didn't, you know, diminish the, the price point of the car at all. Uh, everything that you touched was relatively premium. And granted, I was probably in a top spec one that you can get with everything on it at the auto show um, in Frankfurt. But it was, uh, I, I was super impressed. And I'm like, you know what, this is, this is like the perfect runabout car. Um, I see why they're not selling it in the U.S. I could see why they would maybe in like California only. I, I just don't think this is going to be a big seller in the U.S. if it ever gets here. So I think smart move to keep it to other markets and let us get the ID for like Martin was saying. But but for me personally, this would be a great replacement for my electric smart car that I do all like my run around shops and uh, because uh, it's the right size. It's it's got great range, it's got good charging. It has apparently terrible software but hopefully that's fixed and uh you know i, I think it's cool tom what do you think of the interior yeah i agree with you it, it there's a lot of plastic but it wasn't it didn't feel cheap plasticky like the chevy bolt does to me the bolt the inside you know and i've said this before it just um i can't wait for the refresh next year because it just felt it just feels incredibly cheap and Understandably, GM put all their money into that huge battery they gave. They made an affordable 250 mile EV when nobody else was a few years ago. So I understand that, but I don't get that feeling in the in it, you know, in the ID3. It actually felt like, and we have a picture up right now. If you notice, it has the same kind of um, a gear selector as the BMW i3, and in the same location. And that's important because I felt. BMW i3 when I sat in it. Um, it, it, you know, although it doesn't have as premium materials as the i3, the way it was laid out, um, the, the small instrument cluster behind the uh, steering wheel, the gear shifter right there on the steering column, the openness, how it felt roomy on the inside. I, you know, it felt like, uh, just like a different version of the i3. And that, that's just how, how, how I felt. And you know, like Volkswagen has said, um, where the interior is like a Passat. When the i3 came out, BMW was saying the same thing. They were saying it's the size of a 1 Series, but with the interior volume of a 3 Series. So, you know, they're able to do things with those dedicated platforms, push the driver's com uh, compartment up further, push the rear uh, uh, seating a little bit fur further back. So it creates this, this interior volume that you don't get in cars with an exterior volume of that size. So, um, yeah, I feel like you, Kyle. I, I really, I like the interior. Look, I mean, you know, how premium do you want the car to be at that price point? You, you're, you're not going to get, you know, Jaguar leather uh, on a car that's, you know, starting price of 30,000 euros. You know, it just, it isn't happening with a big battery to go far. You know, if you want to squeeze a little, you want to go mini, mini Cooper SE on you know, and put a 30, 
five kilowatt hour battery or 32 kilowatt hour battery in the car, you can afford to do some premium <laughs> materials on the inside. But then you've got people saying, oh, the damn thing only goes 100 miles. It's worthless. So you, you can't have you can't have premium materials, a huge battery, long range and cheap price. There's, there's got to be compromises somewhere. And yeah, they used a little extra plastic on the inside, but I think they did it well. And I'm with Kyle. It doesn't feel cheap. Um, it doesn't feel high, high end premium, but for, for that price point, I think it's more than what you, you should expect. And, and uh, worth remembering as well in places like Germany, where the incentives are up to nine and a half thousand euros, a 40 grand car becomes a 30 grand car. And all of a sudden that's a big decision to go, well, hang on a minute. That's a, that's it's a different price point to those if I'm going to move up towards Tesla, Polestar, right? And they're obviously yeah. different segments of car as well. It's, you know, we shouldn't compare cars just because they have batteries, which was the old thing that where people have always done. So it, that makes it a very, a very affordable car if those countries have the good incentives. Right on. So uh, speaking of European small cars, the Volkswagen ID3 we learned this week uh, not the ID3, but the uh, the E Up, which is the Volks the the electric Volkswagen that uh, they've been selling. Besides, they have the E Golf, but they also have the E Up. That's a very small uh, electric Volkswagen, and that's a uh, that's a conversion from. They have a gas version of that as well. So that will be replaced with the ID One electric city car, but only in 2025, which seems like a long ways away. And and while we're talking talking about Volkswagen, you know that's that's a long ways away, so that's not really big news. But the, the Volkswagen has also trademarked the names E Beetle, E Golf Classic, E Carmen, and E Kubul, which is kind of kind of neat. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if we really need to talk about any of that there. Uh, but speaking of cars too, Except sorry, the best you, you like the ever. I love well. I love the up uh, exclamation point uh, GTI. I think those are so cool. So I, I love that there's an electric version. I would drive one if it was here. They are so cool and happy. Uh, uh, what's what's his name? Uh, Bjorn, Bjorn uh, Norway Bjorn, EV Bjorn. Uh, he actually has some, some videos. If you look at his uh, YouTube channel, you can go back and, and find he drives the E up. And so you can see, you know, it's a it's a low cost vehicle. It's small. It's kind of you know minimal kind of range. But you know, it, it, but it's a budget vehicle, so yeah, it, and it sells. It was selling it decently for a while. But uh, speaking of you know European Volkswagen things, we'll hit just really quickly. I just want to mention that Poland has has a company called Electromobility. I believe that's some like a uh, national some national companies. So I'm not exactly sure what the situation there, but they uh, inter presented their all electric Isera this week, uh, which they may build on the MEB platform. Um, that we we have one of our writers, Mark Mark Hain is from Poland, and he was a little skeptical. This thing is really going to happen, you know. Maybe it's uh, I don't know. Maybe they're trading in on just a, a more nationalistic fervor there. I, I don't know. And do we really need another MEB car? We've already got you know Volkswagen has already got the Volkswagen Audi, Skoda. Um, I'm, I think I'm missing one, but yeah. But it, you know, it looks nice enough, and it'd be kind of interesting to see what develops there. But we haven't uh, talked about what's charging up in our driveways this week, so we wanted to make sure we did that before we finish up. So, Kyle, I don't know, you want to give us a quick update? You're crisscrossing country. You're by the Grand Canyon right now. How's how's that trip going? Right, everything's been going great so far. We're in Page, Arizona. We've been camping most nights, but last night. <laughs> It got a little too rural. We were at the Grand Canyon. We went into the national forest behind. We pitched our tent. We're like, we started hearing animals, and then we started <laughs> seeing animals, and then the sun started going down, and we're like, uh, well, maybe we should just pack up and get out of here. I mean, like, we started hearing, like, sounds all around us, so we <laughs> threw all the stuff in the car, right. and then it was, like, 30 miles of back forest, rutted, you know, meaty dirt roads to take a shortcut over to page otherwise we would have had to backtrack about four hours around the grand canyon and right. so we were doing a road that i wanted to do in the daylight but honestly it was like a rally circuit it was great we're dodging deer dodging antelope i don't even know what was coming out as mountain lion <laughs> you name it we saw it and uh that then we ended up here in page we got in at like one in the morning or so but the road trip has been great tons of great charging opportunities lots of v3 chargers just went through death valley 123 degrees fahrenheit 
Um, wow. Model 3 handled it quite well. I put nice. the car in track mode to see the temperatures of everything because I don't have my like data logging stuff. Uh, but the rear motor was orange, which was warm, uh, but everything else was green. And there was no degradation of performance. When you floor it at 123 degrees, it was great. Air conditioning kept up really well. We had sunshades in the back for the dogs. We went to uh, the lowest point of elevation in all of North America, 282 feet below sea level, which was really cool, Badwater Basin. And, um, yeah, it's been been amazing. Follow the, the Twitter, Out of Spec Motoring, to see some cool shots of uh, some of the scenery that we've been seeing along the way. It's really amazing. We're off to Moab today. We're going to try and do some off-roading in the Model 3, maybe get some wheels up in the air. And uh, this trip really makes me want to have a Model Y. Oh, you 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 have a, you also hit the uh, salt flats too, right? Recently. Oh, that's right. We haven't had a chance to talk about that. We went yeah. to the Bonneville Salt Flats, and uh, you know, I, I have been to the Salt Flats a few times, but I've never been there on such an empty day. And there was literally just a couple people out there. So you're able. The Salt Flats is just a dry lake deposit of salt uh, that you can drive on. It's uh, open land owned by a Bureau of Land Management and. Uh, so you can drive your vehicle on it as fast as you want, which we did. And so we were able to get the car up to 158 miles per hour. Um, it took four runs for me to get there. The first three um, were, I had to slow down for some traffic way out in the distance. But driving on salt is real sketchy. It's not like doing 158 on pavement, which you can do yeah. any day, all day, super easy, no problem. This, the car is moving around. It's super, It's like driving on ice. It's super slippery. It's very sketchy. Uh, braking is is really odd, and uh, it was just a really cool experience, bucket list item. But uh, 158 miles an hour, the car limited power at 30% state of charge. Everything was in the red. We got the drivetrain nice and warm. Uh, it was 100 and something degrees outside, and uh, it didn't break, so that was good. And there's a supercharger right on the other side of the flats. Oh, nice. Yeah, people don't realize like a speed and that kind of a surface. That's like a non-grip surface. So you know bad things can happen really easily. Yeah. So you, yeah. you, unless I, you really have experience in, in room and in a vehicle, you don't want to drive like yeah. over 80 miles an hour on a dirt road or on, on salt. Yeah, it's very similar to dirt. I'd say basically between 100 and 140 uh, was really sketchy. And then after 140, it kind of settled down. You know, I, I took the dogs out, left them in the hotel room. We took the roof box off, of course. Uh, and you can see here in the photos, if you're watching on YouTube, we just destroyed this car with salt. I'm honestly surprised it's held together and not rusted through at this point. Um, but uh, Tesla won't care when I trade it into them, I'm sure. <laughs> So, hey, uh, Tom, so this week, you, what, what you've had, you've had some experience with the BMW i3 with the Rex this time. You're like our BMW i3 expert at this point. <laughs> well, I have owned two of them. Right. Uh, I don't own uh, an i3 anymore. But yeah, if you're if you recall, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this on the podcast. I did um, uh, the 70 mile, uh, Inside EV 70 mile an hour highway range test with a uh, new uh, BMW i3 BEV, all electric. And we did uh, 141 miles driving at a constant 70 miles an hour. Um, so I wanted to do one with the range extender. And luckily, a friend of mine just took possession of a 2020 i3S Rex. So I asked him, could we, could we go out uh, on the turnpike and do the, do the, uh, the, the 70 mile an hour range test? And he obliged. And uh, we did it a couple of days ago, finished up with. 126 miles, um, which is exactly the EPA rated range for the um, i3 with range extender. So a um, little surprising. The, the odd thing about what BMW has done now with the i3 is for the the, the early, i the, the initial i3s, the, uh, the BEV version was rated at 81 miles of range. The range extender was rated at 72 miles of range. Then when they increased the battery size to uh, the the 33 kilowatt hour the, the 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 difference in range was 114 for the Bev and 97 for the Rex still kind of close but now with the 2019 and 2020 and it has the 42 kilowatt hour battery the Bev is rated at 153 and the Rex is rated at 126 kind of doesn't make sense because with the Rex 
you just lose six and a half percent of the battery. Uh, well, you don't lose it, but the range extender turns on when the battery drops below six and a half percent. And then you also have this extra weight penalty of like 350 pounds or so. So it shouldn't be like it. it I'm surprised that the EPA range rating is so great on this latest, um, the difference in it is such a difference in the Bev and Rex versions because it wasn't on the first two iterations. And our range test kind of proved that that's wrong because we achieved the EPA range rating on the Rex and on the Bev, as you would expect, we got 15 miles less. So right. I don't know what BMW did with the with the EPA range rating, but it's it's definitely odd. Um, in any event, yeah, we did that. Now we've done ten cars. Kyle does some of the seventy mile an hour range tests. I do some of them. Sometimes we do the same car, um, but we're compiling a list on Inside EVs now where we do these seventy mile an hour highway range tests uh, on the same courses, so we can kind of compare vehicles side by side. Uh, I'm trying to get an e Nero now, um, but unfortunately, Kia doesn't have any of them in the test fleets, um, the, like the test drive fleets, I guess, because it's not a new car anymore. They've kind of pulled them out, so I can't secure one. If anyone lives in the New Jersey area and has an e Nero and wouldn't mind loaning me their car for the day, maybe I can loan you my Model 3 for a little bit. Um, we can make a swap and give me some t seat time in your car to do the range test. I'd appreciate it. Wow. We do have the, uh, I don't know if, whether you sent it uh, for broadcast, but I did have your, uh, your, your graph that you've done. Do you want me to put that up or is that still top secret? Oh no, the, the range graph, you can put that up. Sure. That, okay, that shows the, um, those are the uh, vehicles that we've done so far. As you can see, the, uh, the model three long range has had the uh, best range at a constant 70 miles an hour. So far we did 290 miles. That was with my personal car. Uh, model Y is next. Then you've got the 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 Kona did 238. The Bolt at 226. The Leaf did, uh, and that was the Leaf Plus 190. Then we have the Hyundai Ionic at 171. Then you see the BMW i3s Bev at 141. The Rex we just did at 126. The Mini Cooper SC at 108, and the Kyle's <laughs> famous smart car. Did a whopping 51 miles at 70 miles an hour. That's my right. favorite of them there. <laughs> the smart car. It's a great car. You know what? You're so much happier during those 51 <laughs> miles than you are in the 290 <laughs> of your you, model. You be just looking at it on the chart. So there you go. Just job done. So, hey, hey, Tom, are, are we going to have this on a, on a page so people can access this page on a regular? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So right now um, I've been putting it on all on the posts of all of the range tests we do at the bottom, uh, right. but it's going to have its own dedicated post and uh, eventually page. Awesome. We just all wanted right. to we wanted to get a bunch of vehicles on there first before we gave it its own page, you know, and we now that we've got 10 it's starting to get to the point where, hey, yeah, this is something to look at. Right on. And once I get back from this trip, I have a whole bunch of Teslas lined up just to fill in the list of all of them. So from Model X's pre-Raven, post-Raven, same with S, all of the Model 3 variants. Actually, while I'm in New York for Polestar, that night I'm taking my mother's standard range plus and doing a range test in that. So we'll have just a full Tesla list uh, in just a few weeks. Awesome. Excellent. I was going to get a uh, Kyle. I don't know if you were go if you have the ability, but I can rent one. I wanted to do the Model Three um, uh, long range rear wheel drive. I can yeah, get a hold of one. one of them and do it. Do you have that? Yeah, we have one in in the family, so I can do that no problem. And because I on think the, that one, that should be the best. That should have the longest range, right? Yeah, either that or the new Raven Model S. We'll see. Uh, I mean, of the Model Threes. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. of the Model yeah. Threes. The, yeah. The long range rear wheel drive is just the best configuration of any Model Three. Period. I think that's my, uh, that was my friends have that one. Yeah. yeah. If yeah. if you don't need to, you know, the all wheel drive for you know, if you live in some of the northern states, people feel more comfortable with all wheel drive. Like we do a lot of driving up in Vermont, and that's why I wanted to get the all wheel drive. And that's only like five point six seconds to sixty. No, no, it's way less than that. The rear-wheel drive, it? it, it's, uh, it's been software updated over time. I had one. I loved it. That's what we set the Cannonball record in. It's just the best long-distance EV you can possibly get, uh, I think. We'll test the Model S Raven now that it has 250 kilowatt charging, although I hear it only just hits it for a half a second and then falls off. 
Right on. Hey, so, okay, that brings us, that, this brings us to the end of our show. But if you have any questions about the Polestar 2, like we said earlier, Kyle's going to be driving that in a few days. So leave them down in comments. Or if you'd like, go over to the Inside EVs forum and we have a, a Polestar uh, section there. We have just like a few of the review videos. But we'd love to, if you're a customer or, in, or if you're interested in that car, we'd love to have you, you know, tell us what your plans are. If you plan on, on getting it, what, what your expectations are. Right. So thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post or the in the YouTube comment section below or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. And don't forget, you can find and follow uh, all of our panelists on Twitter. Tom at, at Tomalog. Uh, Martin is at EV News Daily. Kyle is at Out of Spec. And I'm dominic underscore y uh, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications below and we'll see you all next week ciao